Okay. So welcome everyone to our presentation on living shorelines protection. Uh, before we get started, I want to take a moment to respectfully acknowledge that our work at EOS Eco Energy is done on the traditional unceded lands and waters of the Mi'kmaq. So today's speakers, we have a few. Starting off with our first presentation, we have Brittany Dixon and Freya Clark from the Nature Trust of NB. Uh, Brittany Dixon is the Conservation and Engagement Coordinator with the Nature Trust of New Brunswick. Uh, Brittany enjoys engaging with supporters through their various programs and projects, and she looks forward to always showcasing unique beauty and biodiversity of their nature preserves. And Freya Clark is an outdoor enthusiast with a passion for forest preservation. She grew up in the beautiful seaside town of St. Andrews, New Brunswick. Freya joined the stewardship team at the Nature Trust of New Brunswick in 2020. At work, Freya spends her time in the field and behind the scenes carrying out management tasks on existing nature preserves. She works closely with the Nature Trust stewards and volunteers to continue to protect these special places. All right, and with that, uh, before I have actually turned things over to them, I just wanna ask everyone to remain muted. We will keep questions to the end in order to just stay on schedule. Uh, please write them in the chat box and I can relay them at the end of the talk. If you are joining in on the phone, we will give you a chance to ask your questions too at the end. So thank you very much, Brittany and Freya, and I will turn things over to you now. All right, thank you. I'm just gonna share my screen to get started. Okay. So you can see the PowerPoint there, hopefully. Awesome, yeah. Well, thanks uh, so much for, for having us here for this webinar today. I gotta say, we normally do webinars, not meetings. So it's kind of cool to see a few faces looking back at me instead of just the, you know, the blackness of the abyss. So yeah, it's neat to kind of have that interaction uh, component to this. But um, yeah, so I'm gonna talk about shoreline stewardship a little bit and get into a little um, brief intro to willow staking as well later on. And let's just jump into it. I guess before we get started, um, like Cal was saying, we're from the Nature Trust of New Brunswick. So just a bit of background on us in case you're not familiar with our organization. But we are a land uh, conservation organization. Our mission is made up of these three main pillars here on the screen, to conserve, to steward, and to engage. And so throughout all the many years of the Nature Trust, we have conserved over 11,000 acres of land in New Brunswick, and they have been transformed into over uh, 70 nature preserves. And we do a lot of this amazing work with our network of uh, volunteer stewards. There's over 250 around the province who are really, we always say the eyes and the ears on our nature preserves and do fantastic um, you know, stewardship work. And finally, that last pillar to engage, uh, that's kind of on point today because it's really exciting to be here with you and uh, you know, talk to you about um, you know, landowner stewardship and biodiversity and uh, species at risk, uh, topics like that. It's always uh, very exciting to kind of engage with the public. So thanks, Cal, for inviting us here today. So let's jump right into it with my first topic here, uh, shoreline stewardship, caring for shorelines to protect your property and our riparian ecosystems. So we often uh, talk about riparian zones when we talk about shoreline stewardship. And so I thought it was important to kind of give a definition to what that means exactly, because it is uh, you know, that transition zone between the body of water. So in this illustration here, um, that stream, that river, that lake, that sort of thing, and then that upland vegetation. So through this zone, you'll find moisture loving vegetation like willows, elders and shrubs as they have listed in that uh, diagram there. And so uh, for waterfront landowners and folks who frequent the shorelines of New Brunswick's many water bodies, I think it quickly becomes apparent that there is amazing potential through this zone for recreation, for community, for exploring wilderness, for enjoying the natural beauty of these spaces. Uh, so, you know, how we treat these shoreline zones and how we treat shoreline properties, it plays a huge role in how we maintain the benefits of the space. And so speaking of benefits, I'm going to jump into, you know, hotspot of biodiversity as kind of the first benefit to these zones. So, you know, it's a unique composition. There are unique features here. And this area along the water, you know, it's a hotspot for plant diversity, for wildlife diversity. 
There are many rare and vulnerable species through this area, like the cobblestone tiger beetle that I have uh, pictured here. So they make this home their, um, they make the space their, their home essentially. And so there are shaded areas in these spaces uh, where species are protected. And because of that, they're able to reproduce, they're able to feed. And riparian zones as well, they're known for their high quality uh, water and the flowing water through there. So even for water dwelling uh, species and, and fish, um, you know, they, uh, they too really benefit from protecting these important spaces. All right, and then beyond that, there's a lot of natural vegetation that thrives in this area. These deep rooted, um, diverse, kind of plant species, uh, there's winterberry, there's willow, there's common alder trees, just to name a few. Um, but not only does vegetation, you know, provide shade, like I just mentioned, but the deep roots help to secure the shoreline against erosion that can come from storms, come from uh, ice scouring, uh, things like that. And so they also protect against runoffs from contaminants and, and waste. Um, that would otherwise be contributors, you know, as they come into the water that they would lower the water quality, they contribute to loss of wildlife, that sort of thing. But vegetation and protecting the vegetation in these spaces also plays a huge role in uh, ensuring that they're, you know, protected and pristine in perpetuity. And all right, with all that said, that was a quick look at the benefits, but you know, so at this point, what can you do to protect and steward these vital shoreline areas? Good question. So I've just got a quick list here of some sort of um, great places to start, some very low maintenance, I think, uh, options available for, for you know, shoreline um, owners and for stewards. So you can maximize uh, native vegetation when you're building on the land. You can, uh, you know, try to keep the trees and the shrubs that are already existing in the riparian zone intact. Uh, that's a great first step, just kind of leaving it as is essentially when building. You can create a single path of access to the water. So this avoids you know, compacting the soil more than necessary. It avoids trampling or disturbing existing vegetation. Um, you can kind of what we say, uh, let nature be the gardener, which I think might be uh, you know, hard for some people to kind of take a step back and, you know, just let nature do its thing and let that normal, that natural vegetation just thrive, let it remain untouched. Um, but, you know, again, those deep rooted grasses, those shrubs, they will then fill in that shoreline and provide some of those big benefits that I was talking about before. And finally, uh, you know, a last little recommendation here, last but not least, we recommend, you know, pruning the limbs of trees to improve your view of the water um, instead of you know, cutting down the entire tree. So that's sort of a, um, a nice way to you know, still get that access that be able to view the water, especially when as a shoreline owner, um, that's probably a big reason as to why you were attracted to that location in particular, but um, just an excellent option pruning instead of kind of cutting um, down the whole tree. All right. Uh, so I've just got a couple sort of scenarios here to drive home some of these points. So I'm going to tell a couple little stories. But my first scenario here is about good intentions gone wrong. And we're talking about the Joneses in this case. So imagine, if you will, that the Joneses live in this cottage and they have hired a local landscaping company to come in and grade the property, to plant a lawn, because um, they want to improve their views. Again, perfectly uh, normal thing to kind of uh, want to do. But then they started noticing that every spring the banks of the shoreline would be uh, damaged from winter ice, from the spring freshet coming in, uh, and it started to erode their uh, shoreline, their property. So then in an effort to stop the erosion, they installed this uh, rock retaining wall. But then they started to notice that the frogs and birds and other species that they would normally see on their property, you know, they started to disappear. So in the end, the result here is that the Joneses had to uh, spend a lot of time and a lot of money building this retaining wall, uh, putting in the rocks, even maintaining the landscaping that they had done along the, along the bank, along the shoreline there. Um, and they're running into, you know, quite a few problems because of that. All right, and then alternatively, 
we have what we call the healthy landscaping option here. So I know the cottages themselves look very similar, but let's imagine that this is the Smith's property in this case. And so the Smiths have uh, designed and built their cottage to have access to the water at a single point there, as you can see, by removing only the necessary uh, vegetation. And so they have their property, um, you know, through the winter, uh, especially, you know, there's less shoreline damage with those winter storms and with erosion. Uh, they're not seeing that damage quite like they saw at the Joneses uh, property. And they were still able to benefit from the shade from the trees around their cottage. So in the summer heat, they were a little bit cooler. And this shaded protection as well, it allowed their property to remain home to the riparian plants and the wildlife in that area. And ultimately the Smiths did not need to spend, you know, a lot of time and money on landscaping maintenance. They're able to still enjoy the benefits of their property and probably the things that drew them to that property uh, in the first place. So that's just kind of a look at two scenarios. And then here's a side by side, again, kind of picture the difference there. Um, but hopefully it got you thinking a little bit, uh, especially if you're, you know, a shoreline um, a landowner, um, just kind of options that are available to you and some of the some of the results that uh, you might see. All right, and I don't have much time to dive into our landowner stewardship program, but I did want to bring it up here and just in case I piqued your interest with some of these, these tips and recommendations. Um, but I just wanted to yeah, mention our, our LSP, uh, landowner stewardship program. So it's a voluntary program, Nature Trust staff, um, through this program, they offer support and guidance to landowners who are interested in preserving and stewarding their own properties, um, you know, in order to protect sensitive habitats, to protect the wildlife that exists there. And so I've just kind of quickly listed a few ways in which you may, um, if you're part of this program, you know, get support from the Nature Trust or from some of our partners as well, but it's really tailored to landowners and their environmental goals and what they want to kind of see, you know, with their property and the stewardship um, kind of tips and tricks that they would like to like to learn. So that was really quick, but if you wanna learn more about it, please do reach out and we'd be happy to talk to you about uh, LSP. All right, and I wanted to also highlight our Shoreline Stewardship uh, brochure. It's kind of everything I just talked about in this presentation, if you wanted to recap that in a brochure format, uh, that's available or you can download it on our website under publications, so yeah. All right, and now I'm gonna take a few minutes just to go through uh, this idea of willow staking, if you're not familiar with it, and the idea you know, that it maintains the integrity of river banks. So first question here is what is willow staking? It's also sometimes called uh, live staking, and it essentially involves uh, as very basic um, way of describing it, you know, taking live sections of a tree, removing the twigs and the leaves, making them into stakes and then quite literally, you know, pounding them into the ground with a mallet or sliding them into the mud. But that's a very basic way of looking at it. So why do we, why do we do this? Um, I mean, the fact remains, you know, the more vegetation that's lost from the banks, the less stable they become. And so if we're able to plant these stakes, these cuttings of willow along eroded river banks, then that can really help us to slow the rate of erosion in these riparian zones. And so willows themselves, are a fantastic option for this as you know they provide food and shelter for wildlife. I've mentioned willows a couple times already I think as you know um, a species that already exists in the riparian zone and you know flourishes quite well in that space um, and they really just maintain the integrity of the shoreline overall. And so along the Nash Walk there are two species of willow that are recommended for planting. There's the red-tipped willow and the sandbar willow. And they both grow naturally along the Nashwalk River. They're commonly used for restoration purposes. And I wanted to give a shout out to the Nashwalk Watershed Association because they had me out recently for an event of willow staking and I learned a lot. I took a lot of pictures and so I have just some quick tips here to share with you today if you're kind of curious about it and want to maybe get into it yourself a little bit. So let's talk about preparation really quickly here but you collect these uh, cuttings of willow when they're dormant. So usually, um, you know, in the fall, could be up to the early spring, but more so, you know, in the late fall. Cuttings should be a minimum of two centimeters wide at the base. Um, all the twigs and branches should be trimmed 
and they should be cut at a 45 degree angle at the, at the bottom at the base. And I recommend actually marking the bottom to ensure the cuttings are not planted upside down. Uh, you might think in the moment, you know, you know which way is up, but it does get a little confusing. So if you can mark the bottoms in this preparation uh, period, that does help just to put a little mark there. And then they can be bundled together. They're stored in plastic in a dark, moist, cold environment. And they even recommended you can store them in a snow bank over the winter. And then seven to 10 days before planting in the spring, you soak those cuttings in water and you would just entirely cover them in water. Uh, this is a picture here from our time out on the Nash Walk and they dumped the water at this point, but they had been soaking for a few days and they were a little bit stinky at that point, but we had a truck full of them and we headed out. It was a lot of fun. Um, and I'll also just mention too, really quickly, um, in highly eroded areas, some banks may need to be actually sloped to a shallower grade for plantings to be uh, successful with willow staking. So I just put a really quick illustration there on the bottom. Um, but if you're interested in kind of that concept, you know, reach out. Um, but uh, the, you know, the idea of kind of re-sloping that bank so it's a shallower grade, so you'll have a better chance of success there. All right, before planting, so they can be cut, but should be at least 60 centimeters long when you're planting them. You again can cut the bottoms at a 45 degree angle before planting. And the smaller ones are easier to uh, clip, but the larger ones may require more kind of heavy duty tools. Um, there's a kind of blurry photo there in the background of someone cutting one. And those tools were fine, but didn't quite work for the, the larger ones, but you can still plant them as is. It's just helpful to kind of give them that one more snip at a 45 degree angle. Uh, check the nodes when clipping and planting. Um, again, making sure that they're in the correct orientation to grow. Ideally, there's been a mark left on the bottom or if they were harvested flat on top and angled on the bottom, that should help you know kind of which way is up as well. And then finally, the last stage here, planting. So they can be planted um, as soon as the ground has thawed in the spring. I was told, you know, one in six willows will take, will grow. So you can plant them pretty densely in that space because you want the best chance of success again. And they can be planted up to the low water mark. And since the water may be high and may be kind of you know, changing throughout the spring, you may need to do multiple plantings. Um, but they can be planted in the water as well, as you can sort of see in that picture there, get your rubber boots on and yeah, just get right in the water and start, you know, pounding them into the, into the mud. And they can be placed, um, well, the, the stakes themselves can be placed three quarters um, of the willow into the ground at an angle. It doesn't really matter the angle that you place them at, but they should be kind of slotted into the mud at an angle. And they're in a pattern of a half meter diamond, which I'll have a picture of that on my last slide coming up next. And you can use a rubber mallet to plant the larger ones to really kind of hit them into the ground. But the smaller ones we found, you know, they just slide right into the mud. Um, you just might need, again, rubber boots and some gloves to kind of help you out. And again, I mentioned a couple of times, check those nodes, check the orientation because you wanna be planting them the right way up and not upside down. I'm not sure if it would work quite as well if they were upside down. Yeah, and that's just to show uh, that diamond formation that I mentioned. If you can see my mouse, I'm not sure, but you know, there's one, two, three, four, top, bottom, left, right. Um, and it's throughout the, the zone there. So there can be rows of them to kind of, again, densely pack them within into that um, riparian zone. Um, yeah, so there could be, yeah, quite a few rows. I guess this picture, the smaller bubble picture, it's zoomed out, I'm not sure if you can see, but there's quite a few uh, cuttings of willow stakes all through that space. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, more information, you know, reach out to us. This is all part of the Nashwalk Watershed Association's uh, project as well. So you can probably, I'm sure, reach out to them. They'd love to answer your questions too. Um, it's part of their Neils Flats Forest Restoration Project. And I'm not sure if they have more volunteer opportunities coming up, but if you get the chance to do this, it was a lot of fun. So I would recommend uh, going out for a few hours with them and getting your hands dirty. It was great. All right, so I think I'm passing it over to uh, Freya now to take it away. Yeah, okay, so I'll dive into a quick overview of invasive plant species management. I'll also tag in another organization here, uh, a great organization in New Brunswick that works specifically with invasive species is the New Brunswick Invasive Species Council. So if 
If you're looking for more information on, on more invasive plants, you can talk to us for sure, but you can also reach out to them. <laughs> so the invasive plants that I'm gonna talk about today are Japanese knotweed, woodland angelica, glossy buckthorn, purple loosestrife, Japanese barberry, and garlic mustard. And these are all very common invasives in the province. They are definitely not our only invasives, but we deal with these ones quite a lot. Next. So I'll start with my least favorite invasive species. Japanese knotweed is a particularly nasty invasive because it can spread through any part of the plant. So a leaf fragment, a stem fragment, the roots, and, and also by seed. Um, so they're really quite, quite an intense one. So these plants have bamboo-like hollow stems and triangular leaves. And you can see the leaves in this picture and they can grow up three meters. They have small white green flowers that grow in sprays or kind of like clusters near the end of the stem where the leaf meets the stem. And they bloom in late July or August. So to remove these plants, you want to re remove them before they flower in spring and early summer. Um, you can cut the plants at the base and then tarp over the root masses. So you just put the, a black tarp covering the root masses and pin the tarp down. And that prevents light getting in to the plant. And it, it also, the black tarp lets it kind of cook in the sun or solarize in the sun to prevent it from growing back quickly. And one thing with, with Japanese knotweed that's quite important is that you don't pull up the plant by the roots because they are very sensitive and there's, there's an indication that pulling the plant up actually makes them sprout back more vigorously. Um, so with invasive species, it's always important to think about how you're disposing of the plant material after you've removed it. Um, with most of the plants that I'm going to be talking about today, uh, a good practice is to take any of the parts that it might spread from, so in this case, all of the plant, and uh, bag it in black plastic garbage bags, or pile it up and tarp over it with a black plastic tarp, and uh, leave it in the sun for at least about a month um, so that the plants break down and cook in the sun. And then you can dispose of them like you would any garbage. And it's important with invasive species that you don't use them as compost. Next. So another very common shoreline plant that we encounter is purple loosestrife. You'll see this all along rivers. Um, it, they have square shaped stems with narrow triangular shaped green leaves. But what makes them particularly distinctive is their beautiful flowers. Unfortunately, some invasives, invasives are quite pretty, <laughs> but the flowers can be, can vary in length from a meter. So very long, large clusters to only 2.5 to five centimeters. And the flowers uh, are open at any given time during the growing season. So to remove them, it's best to pull out the plant during June, July, and August when it's flowering. And you need to make sure that you remove the root system as well to prevent regrowth. So the disposal is the same sort of thing as, as the uh, knotweed and as many others. You put them in black garbage bags and leave them in the sun to break down and then dispose of them as garbage. Next. So the next plant that I'm going to talk about is woodland angelica. And you can see it in the photo there. Um, so these have two to five centimeter wide stems that are hollow and rigid and where the stems branch, there's usually like a purplish node, um, which helps you distinguish the difference between them and, and the, another plant that has clusters of white flowers, Queen Anne's lace. Um, so the leaves are often about 50 centimeters in length and are divided into many oval, finely toothed or, or jagged leaflets, which are three to eight centimeters long. And these plants can grow to two meters tall. So the flowers that you can see on the picture here can be white to lilac, sort of purpley tinged, and form in clusters on umbrella-like flower heads. 
and the branches of the flower clusters are covered in fine hairs. And these plants disperse through the seed and the roots. So you have to think about that when you're thinking about disposal. So you can pull woodland angelica and you can do this in June before the plants flower to prevent further spread. If you're coming to the flower after, or if you're coming to the plant after it's flowered, you can cut the plant while it's flowering in August. And what you wanna do is chop below the lowest set of branches on the plant to prevent further flowering and then bag the flowers. Um, cutting the flower heads during the bloom lowers, lowers the plant's overall energy and thereby prevents it from continuing to spread. So with disposal of these ones, um, you can bag the flowers and the roots because that's where it spreads from and the bags can be left in the sun to decompose and be disposed of as garbage. Because they don't spread from their stalks, you can leave the stalks on site if you like and um, that will save you some plastic. Um, next. So the next plant I'm going to talk about is Japanese barberry. This is an interesting one because um, it's still sold at some plant nurseries. So you want to keep an eye out when you're purchasing plants to, to put on your property. Um, I live in St. Andrews, New Brunswick, and I've seen a lot of these ones being planted lately because they have really thorny, they're really thorny and the deer don't like to eat them, but they're also a very nasty invasive. So important not to plant them. Um, so they, they have green, blue, green, or dark red, purple, small spatula shaped leaves and very long thorns. And they have bright red oblong berries that are produced late in the summer and early fall. So when you're removing these ones, it's important to uh, wear long sleeves and long pants because they are so thorny and it'll keep you from getting scratches. So when you're removing them, you can hand pull the small bushes or dig up the plants by the roots. And you want to do this in the early summer before the berries are out. You don't want to remove them after the berries are out because you'll just spread the berries around. Um, and when you're disposing of them, uh, these ones are, are a little less problematic than some of the invasive species. So you can make sure that you remove the, the roots, but, uh, and you can cut the roots off and bag them. Or you can leave the whole plant on pallets elevated above the ground, making sure that the, the roots don't touch the ground um, and leave them on site to decompose. And that's just as long as there's no berries left. Okay, next. So another plant is the glossy buckthorn. Uh, these plants have dark brown stalks with white dots on them, and they have smooth edged shiny leaves with deep veins which alternate on the stem. So in some plants, the, the leaves will come out on either side, like adjacent to each other. Um, but on this one, on, on the stem, you, you'll get like one leaf on one side and then another leaf on the other side and then back to this one like that. So like a zigzag, and that's alternating leaves. So these have alternate leaves. And the plants themselves can grow up to six meters in height. And they produce, their seeds are small black berries that attach directly to the branches of the plant, which you can see in the picture there. And they grow in clusters. And the seeds begin to be produced in July. You can hand pull the small plants or dig up the plants during May or June before it goes to seed. Like, like the Japanese barberry, you don't want to remove it once it's got berries. Um, you need to remove all of the roots when you're removing them. Another option, because these ones can grow to be quite large, is you can girdle them. Um, and you need to do that yearly until they die. So when you girdle a, a tree, you need to remove a strip of bark and pith uh, all the way around the tree in a circle. And uh, you want to get right into the wood. And that will prevent it from circulating nutrients and uh, water and it'll eventually cause the tree to die. So with this plant to dispose of it, um, same as the Japanese barberry, it can be left on site on pallets to prevent further growth from roots. You just need to make sure that the roots don't touch the ground or you can cut the roots off and bag them. And uh, yeah, again, you just don't want to deal with it when there are berries on it because you don't want to spread the berries. Next. 
So the last plant I'm going to talk about is garlic mustard. This is an interesting one because it has two different plants. It has a first year plant and a second year plant. Um, and the first year plant is herbaceous or, or, or vegetal. It's not woody. And it has green kidney shaped leaves that grow in rosettes with three to four leaves per rosette. And it grows very low to the ground. The second year plant has alternate three to eight centimeters long triangular coarsely toothed leaves, which are shown in the picture here. And it grows up to one meter tall. The flowers only appear on the second year plant and they flower in early May. When you're removing garlic mustard, you wanna hand pull it in April and May while the plant is flowering. And you can dispose of it by bagging the plant in garbage bags and leaving it in the sun to decompose before disposing of it as garbage. So finally, I'll just talk about strategies for effective removal of invasive species. Uh, you won't always be able to get your whole patch of invasives when you're dealing with them. Sometimes it's just too overwhelmingly large. Um, so you have to think about how to strategically manage it. It's always a good idea to remove plants from the edge of a patch inwards to prevent spread. You can also target areas where you know that uh, sensitive species are like an endangered species and you can push the plants away from that uh, sensitive species. And it's a good idea to push invasive species away from the edges of water bodies because water will really spread that invasive and away from high traffic areas like trails because trails are also a, a really good way for them to spread. So if you push it away from there, you can control that, that spreading a bit more. Okay, uh, next. And that's, that's the end. Okay, so we can pass it on to the next group. Awesome. All right. Thank you, Brittany and Freya. So uh, like I said, we will be holding questions until the end of the webinar, but that was awesome. Thank you. So now we will be moving on to Brittany Cormier from the Petacodiac Watershed Alliance. Um, so before I turn it over to her, just a little bit of background on Brittany. Uh, Brittany, did you want to share your slide while I Wonderful. Can okay. you. Great. So yeah, Brittany is an environmental enthusiast who was ecstatic to rejoin the Petacodiac Watershed Alliance in 2019 after working as a summer student the previous year. She is going on her third year working as the project lead for the water quality monitoring and water guardian projects with the PWA. Uh, Brittany graduated from Mount Allison University in 2019 with a Bachelor of Arts in International Relations and Environmental Studies with a focus on environmental policies. So, all right, Brittany, if you're ready, I'll let you take it from here. For sure. Um, thank you so much for the introduction, uh, Cal, and thanks to EOS for organizing this and inviting us. And uh, I learned so much from the Nature Trust of New Brunswick. Thanks, Freya, and uh, other Brittany. Um, so I have organized a little presentation today, um, whereas I work in a very unique and amazing watershed. It is mostly fresh water. And I know that people from all over are joining us that might be from coastal areas and more dealing more with salt water. Um, in the Petty Kodiak River watershed, if uh, anybody is familiar with the Greater Moncton area, DF Riverview, in our river system, we have a tidal bore that pushes up twice a day. Um, so we, you know, I have done assessments of coastal marshes, love tidal marshes, um, but most of my work uh, for enhancement projects and green infrastructure has been more focused on stormwater and stream bank enhancement. So I'll try to talk a bit about all of that and tie it in what I hope is a nicely, nicely packed bundle by the end of it and happy to discuss with questions afterwards. So yeah, my name is Brittany. I work as a project lead for the Petty Kodiak Watershed Alliance. So I lead the water quality and infrastructure projects and working for a watershed group is amazing. If anybody wants to volunteer with us or your local watershed group, it's a heck of a time. So what is a living shoreline? Uh, well, 
thank more natural infrastructure. It was so nice to see the um, example of the Joneses and you could really see the difference between that art bank and more of a natural approach. So think plants, <laughs> think uh, more gradients, think not so much armored, not so much riprap. We're looking at the best kind of green infrastructure project or natural infrastructure is something that ties in the benefit to people and wildlife. So I have here an image of a living shore in Kokan. And this was done by uh, Vision Astro, uh, which is the local watershed group in Capelay, Shiriak Bay Watershed Association, and the Group de Development du Pays de Coquin. And these three watershed groups, I know Julie Cormier is here as well, has done an incredible job with uh, helping nature heal. And this, you can go visit this in Coquin. It's an incredible living shoreline that does just that. It really uh, weaves in the benefits to you know, the climate change adaptation you get, the wildlife habitat that is added in this area, and the thought that goes into what kind of wildlife benefit from it, and uh, the stabilization that it offers. It really benefits wildlife and people and community. So within Living Shoreline Project, any kind of project that you're looking at, if it's you know, a coastal shoreline or something more along the riparian zones that I might be working with. The importance of planting native is incredible. As we've just learned, invasive species are incredibly difficult to get rid of <laughs> once they are established. And instead of going the distance to do restoration projects, uh, prevention is key. And getting to know your native species where you are is a journey and a half explore a bit, you know, get to know different species. I've put up together a little list of my favorite salt marsh species <laughs> in this slide. Um, these are native to the Petty Kodiak watershed, so it might differ between uh, regions, uh, different watersheds, so get familiar with where you are as well, since it might not be shared, even the same province, you know, it's it can have little differences there. Um, but, you know, flowering plants, different species that can colonize an area and really provide that quick support to erosion prevention and stabilization, such as Spartina species as well. Uh, I have two on the bottom here. Spartina alterniflora is an incredible primary species for coastal marsh habitat that just really can grab on and hold on to as much bank as it can. And it is an early well-established species in coastal marshes uh, in this area. And Spartina patton, you know, these are very common species in tidal marshes at least, and uh, could be considered living coastlines as well. And I just wanted to call it to the invasive species that we are struggling with a little bit. <laughs> Uh, which is Phragmite australis. Um, so it is, I <laughs> see Freya nodding, unfortunately very easy to spread and unfortunately very beautiful. So you can see that seed head, it's very tall, very, very visually there. Um, however, all of those seeds spread and disperse through water, through tires, through, you know, maybe your hiking bag as well. And not only that, but the rhizome growth on the bottom or in the soil is also working against this as well. So this is uh, a species that we are trying to map effectively in our salt marshes uh, and has become quite a widespread issue in the Petty Kodiak watershed. And I know that's shared between New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Maine, Ontario, Quebec, uh, and if you weren't sure what you were looking at, if it might be an invasive, if it might be a native species, get familiar with iNaturalist uh, for yourselves, of course, but also for us. Um, so I know the New Brunswick Invasive Species Council and uh, can use iNaturalist to identify what they think might be an invasive species. And then they can go into the GPS coordinates, find the area, 
and then we can take a sample to actually send to a lab. Um, we have done this in our watershed and sent to a UMB lab where they can take a look at the root system. They can look at it a bit closer and determine if it is in fact the invasive species. So citizen science, very fun, right? So the issue that we're dealing with or that you might be dealing with is bank erosion. And to get you more familiar with the solution is a very easy contrast of bank erosion will happen at a much more accelerated rate if you don't have that green. <laughs> so it's, it's very important and it's incredibly uh, effective to have that buffer zone uh, to where you might be on the water, if it's coast, if it's riparian, if it's the stream, if it's the river, having that zone is very important. And uh, while, whereas my experience is much more um, into green infrastructure projects like rain gardens, which you see here is a cross section of a rain garden that I might make you know, between the uplands and uh, a stream to try and manage stormwater. Uh, it's still a, a good idea to get to know what a root system is and what the power of a root system be. So if anybody has tried to take out a shrub they didn't want in their lawn, or maybe a plant that they just wanted to do some landscaping with that just was so difficult to pull from the earth, that gives you an idea of the tensile strength that a plant can have and why they are so effective at stabilizing stream banks to coasts and uh, the like. So each plant might have its own tensile strength, which means that those roots are really holding together inside of the ground. And they also complement each other. There's different kinds of roots. There's different kinds of seeds, different kinds of roots. Rhizomal growth and uh, top roots are much more different. And having a good biodiversity really helps you no matter what kind of green infrastructure project you're looking at. And to get you more familiar with what I'm used to and the projects that I work with is uh, more in riparian zones. So we have a lot of upstream areas that we've done enhancement projects that uh, might have impacts that have caused severe erosion on the banks and in the riparian zone. And so if somebody's losing a lot of land, that might flag to them that maybe we should do something about it. Not only this, but in riparian zones, it's really important that not a lot of sedimentation like that gets thrown and pushed into a stream at once, since there are a lot of different species that will be impacted by that. But a riparian zone, before I get too much ahead of myself, is a transitional zone between aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems. So riparian means riverin, so this would be more in river or stream systems. But when you're thinking about the coast, about the zone between the ocean, which is a big body of water as well, and the uplands in that kind of area too. And they can be relatively similar. So we always recommend a 30 meter buffer between stream or river and uh, uplands to prevent any kind of land use there. If you are mowing all the way to the stream and you're losing a lot of land, it's very difficult for any kind of vegetation to establish its roots if you're kind of cutting your solution at the knees there. And water's always moving, which makes it always more difficult too. But beautiful. So it's always trying to readjust. You can see in a lot of rivers, try to meander itself. So it, it does, it moves. <laughs> and a river one year might be different 10 years apart. Your grandfather might understand a stream system greatly different than you may today. Um, so how it moves sediment and where it deposits that is also really interesting the way that you have to take this into consideration when you're doing any kind of work to enhance stream banks or riverside. Um, whereas if you armor something, that energy and that water and the sediment might be 
push somewhere else. So you have to think about the strength of the water you're working within. Um, as well, like I mentioned, if there's a great sedimentation from uh, erosion that might happen due to different land uses, uh, that could cover a lot of habitat for fish. Uh, so salmon reds are in stream beds and can be really vulnerable to things like that, as well as freshwater mussels in areas that we work in uh, can just, you know, be completely buried by a large sedimentation like that. Um, and these are species that help and are incredibly important to these ecosystems. So we gotta work together <laughs> and knowing your work area and knowing a plan is uh, a great way to start. So really try to see what was the history of this space? What was land used here? Why is the erosion happening on one side rather than the other? Is it coming from a river? Is it coming from an ocean? Are you working in saltwater habitat? Are you in freshwater? Here's going to have to consider different species of plants, depending. I mean, if you put a freshwater plant by a saltwater marsh, it's just not gonna have the same effect. Um, as well as where is your stormwater going? Um, I know by uh, coastlines, you can see different uh, stream inputs there as well. And if something is, and if your erosion is happening to create new stream, then there might be a more stormwater related issue that you can maybe solve. Um, whereas for more riverine or riparian zones, uh, it is really important to see where the stormwater is coming from and what might be stormwater. Is there livestock nearby? Are they going right to the river? These are important things to consider. And um, what kind of local wildlife do you have around? What kind of species is? This is a beautiful monarch that I saw on vacation because I can't just have vacation without looking at the nature around, um, which was enjoying a great garden right near the coast on Nova Scotia at one of White Beach. So if you're going to do a living shoreline project, if you're going to do any kind of stream bank enhancement, maybe think of putting swamp milkweed, uh, which are really good for the species at risk the monarch or any kind of local wildlife that you might be more familiar with for you. Um, if you're doing anything by stream banks, uh, not so much in coastlines, I don't think you'd have to worry about this as much, but be wary of underground utilities. We always uh, get uh, MB Power and Enbridge uh, to give us a locate before we dig or before we do any projects, just to be absolutely certain that uh, safety comes first. And depending on the scale of your project could depend on what kind of equipment you need. Is this a large scale uh, erosion issue that you're trying to tackle? Um, you might need to get an excavator in and do more of what, uh, what was mentioned in the previous uh, presentation to actually get some grading going. Um, but you're going to have to either make that a fit or get a consultant in is a great idea if you'd like to contact your local watershed group or environmental group to give you some help and guidance on that. That is always a possibility. Um, and don't be afraid to get down and hurt. Even if you have somebody helping you, it's a great idea to get involved as well, to know what the process is, and then you can better manage it if, uh, if you actually taking part in the planting. As well, it's very therapeutic. <laughs> so I must admit, some days don't feel like work uh, when we're doing these kind of projects. Um, as I mentioned, I'm a bit more familiar with rain garden projects as a piece of green infrastructure we do in more urban areas to manage stormwater before it flushes into our river and or stream system. Um, rather than having just that flush into it, rain gardens will capture rain and infiltrate it into the ground. So this is just an example of green infrastructure that could also be on a coastline live in a living shoreline that can really make a big difference. And I can't have a presentation without drinking my favorite flowers as well. So these are the benefits. Stream bank enhancement can be a lot of different 
uh, can be done in a lot of different ways. The ways that the PWA has tackled this before is we don't primarily do willow staking. Uh, since in our watershed, we don't have native willow trees. And we do the same thing that you've seen in the other presentation with alders. We focus on speckled alders and really our methods are the exact same that you just saw. Um, so the same kind of cuttings, uh, the same kind of process. We usually wait until uh, they root a little bit in buckets. We can keep these in our office. They're pretty low maintenance. And we usually have a very good uh, survival rate uh, when we plant them in a uh, stream bank. We've also done uh, alder weaving to really stabilize and catch sedimentation. We've done brush matting. Um, and these are just options for you if you're considering uh, anything along that. So I have just a couple pictures of uh, tree planting and alder staking that we did in uh, Interval. So up towards the village of Teddy Kodiak. Um, and then we had another project on Little River here in our watershed in which we did alder weaving. Really, it was gorgeous and very effective to catch sediment. And of course, working for a shade group, I am here because of uh, a lot of different funders that make my work possible. And uh, I'd just like to take a moment to thank them. And I can open this back up to EOS and any questions, which I'd be happy to answer. All right, great. Thank you very much, Brittany. Um, so yeah, I guess we'll just move straight into questions right now. There are a few in the chat. So I'll just go ahead and ask those on behalf of the people who uh, left them. So to start, um, I have a question regarding the landowner stewardship program, I think from the Nature Trust of New Brunswick, um, asking if it's only relevant for folks with large amounts of property. Um, not necessarily. Um, I'd say reach out to us and we can chat with you more and if we get a better understanding of your property, we can kind of help you out. And if it, um, yeah, it makes sense to kind of talk about the landowner stewardship program as an option for you. But I mean, if it's um, home to like species at risk or if it's ecologically significant area, that sort of thing, like we, we'd love to talk to you about it. So yeah, I'd say it's kind of case by case basis, but feel free to reach out and and yeah, we can go from there. All right, great. And now I have a question uh, regarding fire prevention, actually, when it comes to the vegetation that you might plant in an area. Um, is there anything to take into consideration? Like when you're, I guess, fortifying the grounds with willow staking and whatnot, like has that changed in regards to the, to wanting to prevent for fires from starting? Well, um, in, a shoreline area, um, planting willows and uh, other native shrubs that are adapted to the shoreline and grasses and things like that should not increase your fire risk. Um, yeah, that's, I guess that's, <laughs> that's all I can speak to there. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd recommend looking into the research. That's something that we can do as well, but um, I have not heard of any evidence to show that planting on shorelines increases fire risk. Awesome, okay. And then another question about willow staking. So how long can the cuttings be stored for before they have to be planted? I can speak to that too. And maybe Brittany, Brittany Cormier, you can, you can add to it since you also have cuttings. Uh, when we harvest our willows, we can store them in our freezer for up to six months and still have them sprout and do well. Um, yeah, I wonder, I wonder what you guys do, Brittany. We have stored them in the, uh, our office for a few months, but we really try and get these in as much as, uh, as early as possible, or at least in the same year. Well, I'm not sure about freezing, <laughs> but we have definitely put alder stakes uh, in water for, you know, they they do need to soak up uh, the water for at least, I think, um, I'd say a month would be preferable, uh, maybe 48 hours if you're doing a rush job. And uh, yeah, but 
in order to get them in the ground, it would be pretty pretty good within six months, I say it would be a good idea. They're very resilient though. Even uh, we helped Willow staking at the Kennedy cases. And I wouldn't imagine they'd have be a problem <laughs> lasting. Yeah. All right. Yeah, and so uh, where would you get the willows to begin with? So are we cutting them from wild trees or would you get them from a nursery? Um, where would be a good source for a group or homeowner starting out? Yeah, and they can be cut um, from like natural trees. Uh, Nashwalk Watershed Association collects theirs from Crown Land. And, um, you know, if you're looking for kind of locations where you might be able to find some, I think along like power lines, um, they're gonna be cut away anyway. That might be a good option for you as well. Um, I'm not sure, Brittany, where do you tend to find your uh, willow or, yeah. <laughs> When we do uh, any kind of stream bank enhancement project, we're usually, well, no, we're always working with the landowner. <laughs> so get permission <laughs> on what land you're working with. Uh, so we've been very fortunate in the way that we've been able to uh, work on a very large plot of land. So we get landowner permission to see these alders and alders are very close stream. I remember when I was with uh, EOS doing habitat assessments it was just like a mangrove forest, like they were so thick. And I know that with willows, it's very similar in the way that if you find one, you'll most likely find more as well. So I'd say look for um, friends, partners with great big chunks of land, or maybe reach out to Envy Power and uh, try to get permission that way to, uh, yeah, harvest them. Okay, uh, just a couple more questions. So one was asking for any tips or tools when it comes to identifying invasive species. Um, I saw Lauren had recommended iNaturalist, which is a great resource. You can just grab photos of the uh, plant in question and fauna as well. And you can uh, upload that to iNaturalist. People can help you identify it and iNaturalist can make suggestions, but is there anything other than iNaturalist? Maybe an app or something for your phone? I don't know about uh, a different app. I think iNaturalist is really great for that yeah. purpose. And um, it's it's quite intuitive once you've made your account to take the picture and it'll ID it for you. It's, it's really so fun. Um, but other than that, you can look at resources provided by the New Brunswick Invasive Species Council on their website. Um, if you have an idea of what you're looking for, you can look up pictures and more information online. Yeah, but I'd say iNaturalist is, is really, really great that way. Yeah, and I'll add to that. Uh, speaking of New Brunswick Invasive Species Council, we did a webinar with them on invasive species a little while back and it is on our website, it's recorded. So that goes into like a, I think like a full hour of really kind of dissecting, you know, how you can identify these different species and uh, really, yeah, gets into it. So I recommend that as well, or checking out their website. There'll be more information on there too. All right, great. And the last question is, what is the native distribution of willow trees? So like Brittany Cormier mentioned, they don't have any willow trees native to uh, the Petacodiac area. So is there any knowing where the willow staking might work or where it might not if they're not native to that area? Yes, yeah. Um, I'm not sure exactly, but I know um, like they're found in kind of moist soil areas, uh, cold and temperate climate. So, you know, your northern hemisphere, but yeah, I can't say for sure, you know, they're here, not there in New Brunswick. I don't know, Freya, if you've got more information on that. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I can't, I can't tell you the exact distribution, but I can tell you that another really wonderful thing about iNaturalist is that it gives you species distribution maps. So you can have a look at that and see whether it extends to your area or not. It's also a great way to look at where other people have found species. So if you're going through the process of looking for uh, willow and asking permission to use it, um, you, can see, you can see where it occurs. Yeah. All right. That's great. Thank you very much. So um, we will send out a link of the recording of this workshop to everyone 
later today. I have put in the chat a link to a uh, form just to evaluate the workshop, uh, what you thought of it. It would be great if you could, next couple of days, just take some time, just a couple minutes out of your day to fill that out and let us know how things went. Um, so thank you again, Brittany Dixon, Freya Clark, and Brittany Cormier for your time and for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us today. We really appreciate it. And yes, I hope everyone has a fantastic day. If you don't have anything else to add, I'll stop the recording and yeah, take care. Thank you for coming.